The fourth year students, welcome to the 10th lecture on the subject English literature. The theme of the lecture is Literature of Enlightenment, the Age of Reason, the literature of the 18th century. Objectives. After the lecture, students will be able to define and explain the Age of Enlightenment, identify some of the major ideas of Enlightenment, list Enlightenment thinkers and their contributions, explain the impact of Enlightenment to the literature, during the lecture, the following questions will be discussed. The first, historical background of the Enlightenment. The second, periods of English Enlightenment. The first, early Enlightenment. The main representatives, Daniel Defoe, Jonathan Swift. The second, mature Enlightenment. The representatives, Henry Fielding, Tobias Smollett, Samuel Richardson. And the third, sentimentalism and the bright representatives Oliver Goldsmith, Richard Sheridan, and Robert Burns. The history of England of the second half of the 17th century and during the 18th century was marked by British colonial expansion. London became a great trading metropolis as well as administrative, political, and legal center of England. Its commercial wealth helped the government become the ruling government all over the British Isles and develop contracts outside Britain. London was the center of wealth and civilization. The city became the most important district in London. Houses were not numbered because common population couldn't read. Instead of these numbers, pictures were used. The poets and the literary men attended the coffee houses to read their creations. The 18th century dominated both by theology and science, allowed reason, human capacity, to emerge as a real, genuine, and inspiring force, as the metaphysical poetry. Man was perceived as the active factor in the historical development. God became an abstraction. A lay picture of the world was dominant. The doubt expressed by the 18th century mind was sh shaped into essays. Literature met the interests of the bourgeoisie. The writers of the Enlightenment fought for freedom. Most of them wrote political pamphlets. Periodical newspapers had been published since the Civil War and in 1702 the first daily newspaper was established. Much of the drama was written not in poetry but in prose. The leading form of literature became the novel. The hero of the novel was a representative of the middle class. English literature of the period may be characterized by the following features. The first, as we have already said, the period saw the rise of the political pamphlet and essay, but the leading runner of the Enlightenment became the novel. The prose style became clear, graceful and polished. The poets of the period did not deal with strong human passions. They were more interested in the problems of everyday life and discussed things in verse. B. The hero of the novel was no longer a prince but a representative of the middle class. This had never taken place before. So far, common people had usually been depicted as a comic characters. They were considered incapable of rousing admiration or tragic compassion. C. Literature became very instructive. Problems of good and evil were set forth. The literature of the Age of Enlightenment may be divided into three periods. The first, early enlightenment. The general principles of the Enlightenment ideology are formed in this period. The second, mature Enlightenment, from 1740 to 1760. And the third period of Enlightenment, this period also indicates the beginning of the sentimentalism, the last decades of the 18th century. From the artistic point of view, these decades are characterized in poetry by the classical style. The bright representative of the early Enlightenment was Daniel Defoe. Daniel Defoe, the founder of the early bourgeois realistic novel, was first and foremost the journalist and in many ways the father of modern English periodicals. Daniel Defoe was born in London in a family of nonconformists. His father, a butcher, was wealthy enough to give his son a good education. Daniel was to become a minister in the non-conformist church, but when his training was completed, he decided to engage in business as a horsier. Defoe went bankrupt several times. He was always deep in debt. When Defoe was about uh, 23, he started writing pamphlets on questions of the hour. 
In 1719, he tried his hand at another kind of literature, fiction, and wrote the novel he is now best known by The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe. After the book was published, Defoe became famous and rich and was able to pay his creditors in full. Robinson Crusoe Books about voyages and new discoveries were exceedingly popular in the first quarter of the 18th century. A true story that was described in one of Steele's magazines, The Englishman, attracted Defoe's attention. It was about Alexander Silkirk, a Scottish sailor who had quarreled with his captain and was put ashore on a desert island near South America where he lived quite alone for four years and four months. In 1709 he was picked up by a passing vessel. Silkirk's story interested Defoe so much he decided to use it for a book. However, he made his hero, Robinson Crusoe, spend 26 years in a deserted island. At the beginning of the story, the hero is an unexperienced youth, a rather light-minded boy who develops into a strong-willed man, able to withstand all the calamities of his unusual destiny. Jonathan Swift was born in Dublin, but he came from the English family. He didn't know his father because he was born seven months after his death. His mother didn't pay much attention to him and the boy was brought up and supported by his uncle. After finishing school, he entered Trinity College in Dublin and there he got his bachelor's degree in 1686. Then he became a private secretary and a county keeper to Sir William Temple, who was a retired diplomat and a writer. In 1692, Swift went to Oxford and took his Master of Arts degree. He began writing in 1680, but his first book, The Battles of Books and The Tale of a Tube, were published in 1704. His A Tale of a Tube was a satirical and in his book he exposed religion. The title of the book explains its idea. In the time of a sail fleet, it was natural to throw an empty tube into the sea when he saw a whale to divert the whale from the ship. The ship symbolizes the state and that empty tube, the religion which diverts people from the fight for their rights. On the other hand, a tale of a tube means something imaginary, not true. Swift chose this title to hide his focus for the sake of the comp- conspiracy. In 1713, Swift was made Dean of St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin. He, be- he came in close contact with common people in Ireland. He saw the difficult conditions under which they lived. He wrote pamphlets criticizing the English colonial policy to Ireland. He became very popular among Irish people. In 1726, he wrote his masterpiece, Gulliver's Travels. He was not only popular about British people, but in liter- literary circles. In his novel, he satirized the evil of the existing society in the form of fictitious travels. The novel falls into four parts describing four voyages of Gulliver. The first part is about Gulliver's adventures in Lilliput. The country symbolized England with its corrupt laws and customs. The second part of the book is about his voyage to the country of giants. He showed giants as a good-natured creatures who treated Gulliver kindly. Describing the state of things in the country of giants, Swift tried to show the ideal state and the ideal king who, who was clever and honest. The people lived happily, they hated wars. In the third part, Swift describes Gulliver's travel to Laputa, a flying island where the king had no consideration of his people, only collected taxes from them. Swift exposes severely the academy of science in Legado. He ridicules the scientists of this time, who were busy inventing foolish projects, such as extracting sunbeam out of cucumbers or building houses by beginning from the roof. They tried to convert ice into gunpowder. For this, he was criticized by bourgeois critics for his contempt for science, for the law, people. The fourth voyage of Gulliver brings him to the country of occupied by a noble race of horses, ruling the country with reason and justice. Swift made the horse the embodiment of wisdom, common sense. The description of ugly, greedy creatures, yahoos, opposed to noble horses. After publication of this novel, the bourgeois critics started attempts against Swift. They accused him of his contempt and hatred to humanity and extreme pessimism.
The greatest merit of this novel lies in that satirical description of all vices of the society of his time. The ideas expressed by Swift in his novel had a great influence on the following writers. The outstanding representative of the mature enlightenment was Henry Fielding who came from an ancient aristocratic family and studied at Eton. At 20 he began to write for the stage and in his first play, Love in Several Masks, he exposed the hypocrisy in London. In 1728 he entered the University of Leiden, but he didn't graduate as he couldn't pay for his fees. He wrote a lot of plays. His best political comedies include A Judge of His Own Trap, Don Quixote in England, and Rasquin. In his plays, he criticized various sides of contemporary society, the English code of war, corruption of state officials, and religion. When a strict censorship in the state was introduced, Fielding couldn't write for the stage, and he tried his pen as a novelist. From 1742 to 1752, he wrote his best novel, Joseph Andrews, the history of Tom Jones, a foundling, Amelia. The most popular of his novels is The History of Tom Jones, a Foundling, in which he showed all spheres of life, the code of law, prison, theater. The main character is Tom Jones, in whom the writer expressed his ideal. Tom is generous, a little light-minded, naive, and selfish. The novel themes consist of 18 parts. Each chapter begins with an introduction in which the author tries to express various moral, psychological themes. The novel has a happy end. It symbolizes triumph of good over evil. Samuel Richardson He began his literary career rather late at 50. His works continued the trend of bourgeois realistic trend as well as began a new trend of sentimentalism in English literature. His novels were very popular at his time, not only in England, but also in Russia. His first novel was Pamela, or Virtue Rewarded. In this novel, he depicted the inner world of his characters. He glorified middle-class virtues and exposed the immorality of the aristocracy. Pamela's character was the embodiment of middle-class virtue. The plot isn't very complicated. She was a rich lady's maid. After the lady's death, he was persecuted by his son, but he resisted she resisted all temptation and finally the son fell in love with her and proposed to her. Thus her virtues was rewarded. The second novel, Clarissia, or the history of a young lady, is a tragic story of a young lady who left her home and ran with her, her beloved Lava Place. Lava Lace was very selfish. He tempted Clarissia, but after some time he understood that he loved her and wanted her to be his wife, but she refused. Her sufferings and disappointment undermined her health, and she died. Lava Lace left for Italy and soon was killed at the duel by Clarissia's cousin. His last novel, The History of Sir Charles Grindison, critics admitted that this novel wasn't as successful because it was weaker than his common novel. Tobias Mollett developed further the tradition of English bourgeois realistic novel. William Scott called Fielding and Smollett two fathers of English novel. They paved the way to realism of Dickens and Thackeray. Besides, Smollett's novels were very much like Swift's ones. Smollett then began what he regarded as his major work, A Complete History of England, which took from 1757 to 1765. During this period, he served a short prison sentence for libel and produced another novel, The Life and Adventures of Sir Launcelot Grave. Having suffered the loss of a daughter, he went abroad with his wife and the result was travels through France and Italy. He also wrote The History and Adventures of an Atom, which gave his view of English politics during the Seven Years' Wonder, the guise of a tale from ancient Japan. He also visited Scotland and this visit helped inspire his last novel, The Expedition of Humphrey of Klinke, published in the year of his death. Towards the second half of the century, a new literary trend, that of sentimentalism, appeared. In 1660s and 70s, this trend was represented by Oliver Goldsmith and Lawrence Stern. Unlike their predecessors, sentimentalists believed not in the power of reason, but in the power of feelings. They criticized also bourgeois society, and sentimentalism was a certain step forward. But their criticism was rather inconsistent and limited.
They believed that civilization was harmful to humanity and the man should live close to nature and be free from the corrupting influence of town life. One of the brightest representatives of this spirit was Richard Sheridan. He was born in Dublin. His father was an actor, mother was a writer. He was received a good education, studied at Harrow. His first comedy called The Rivals was staged in 1775. Then several comedies followed, but the most popular of his works was a comedy school for scandal in 1777. Oliver Goldsmith was born in Ireland in the family of a priest. He began his literary career writing a lot of essays. One of the most known was The Citizen of the World. Then he wrote comedies such as The Good-Natured Man, The Mistakes of a Night and a lot of poems, the most famous of which is The Deserted Village. He described those processes that took place in the village under the corrupting influence of the Industrial Revolution. The low level of life of peasants made them leave their villages and go to town to earn some money. He wrote one novel, The Whisker of Wakefield. Robert Burns, the most democratic poet of the 18th century, the most famous in England and especially in Scotland, his birthday on the 25th of the January is celebrated as a national holiday in Scotland. His poetry inspired many poets and was highly appreciated by readers, critics and writers. When Robert and his brother were older, they attended the local school in turn. When the school was closed, Robert received education from a very clever man, Murdoch, by name, and despite the fact that he didn't continue his education in university, his contemporaries considered him rather educated. He is a thoroughly romantic poet, though wholly by the grace of nature, not at all from a con conscious intention, he wrote as the inspiration moved him, not in accordance with any theory of art. Best significant production also is not altogether limited to songs. The Quarter Saturday Night, written in the Spencer stanza, is one of the perfect description poems of lyrical sentiment, and some of Burns' meditative poems and the poetic epistles to acquaintances are delightful in a free and easy fashion. The exuberant power in the religious satires and the narrative Tam of Shantar is undeniable, but they belong to a lower order of work. Conclusion The Enlightenment was a movement in Europe that stressed thought and reason. The legacies can still be seen today. Slavery abolished. People have rights to freedom and natural rights. Governments use separation of powers and women have equality. There are three main periods of Enlightenment. The early period, mature enlightenment and sentimentalism. English novelist, pamphleteer and journalist Daniel Defoe is best known for his novels Robinson Crusoe and Moll Flanders. The importance of Robinson Crusoe to English literature is that it is considered to be one of the most important precursors of the novels as a genre. Sentimentalism asserted that overshone feeling was not a weakness but rather showed one to be a moral person. Sentimentalism in literature was also often used as a medium through which authors could promote their own agendas, imploring readers to emphasize with the problems they are dealing with in their books. Initially, Burns' songs were dismissed by the critics as a trivial, the boundary was discounted, poems on sensitive topics were sometimes ignored, vernacular pieces were deemed in, in, unintelligible, aspects of his character and life were censured. The lecture is over. In order to check your understanding, answer the given questions. You can see a list of the terms of the lecture. Look through the given list of literatures for further study.